Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Ron Patkus. I'm the head of the Archives and Special Collections Library. Thank you all for coming tonight to our program, Responding to Climate Change. I'm very happy to have you here. Um, the, just a couple words of uh, introduction. Um, the program tonight is actually our accompaniment to the current uh, exhibition in the library, which is called Nature and Nature Defiled. Um, if you haven't had a chance, uh, please take a moment to, to have a look at that exhibition downstairs on the main floor. Uh, there's a catalog for it, which there are copies. I saw some of you picked up when you came in, but if not, there are copies there. Um, and this exhibition um, focuses on the work of one of our speakers, Ilsa schreiber Knoll, And um, we're, we're very happy that, that the exhibit is there and I hope you'll enjoy seeing it. I have here um, on the screen, a picture of the web version of the exhibition. And it's a little different. And there's actually some additional content there, including some student essays. So um, in addition to the physical exhibition, which is great, and I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing, there's also some nice content online, if you'd like to take a look at that. Um, I'll, I'll just let you know um, what our format is for tonight. You can see we have three speakers. In addition to Ilsa, we have Jeff Seidman from Philosophy, and we have Laura Haynes from Environmental Studies. So our format will be, um, actually they're in order of speaking. It'll be Jeff, Laura, and Elsa. So they'll each come up and speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, showing you some images online. And um, then at the end, when they're finished, we'll have a, a, a little question and answer period. So I'm hoping um, even with the late start, you know, we should be over in an hour by 6.30 or something like that. Um, I think those are the, the main points I want, wanted to get across. So Jeff, if you'd like to come up, thank you. Oh, where's my, uh, this folder? Okay, hi. So uh, my title sounds a little bit like a song from a Broadway musical or maybe a self-help book <laughs> title, um, but I hope to actually convince you that it expresses something serious and true. Um, when we think about climate change, um, I think many of us feel disempowered. It's the most global, huge scale problem imaginable. And so many of us think very naturally that it'll be decided. What happens will be decided by some powerful politicians and a few corporate executives. And the rest of us are just sort of uh, passengers on the ship who can you know, maybe shout at the cabin a lot, but, uh, but that's about it. Um, I wanna convince you that that's exactly wrong, especially now at this particular moment in 2020, 2022. Um, that the shape that the climate change problem has right now gives ordinary people, and to qualify it, that means ordinary people in affluent societies who have a little bit of wiggle room. So anyone though, who's like able to sit in a uh, room at Vassar College and listen to this talk, for instance, um, it gives ordinary people more leverage and more far reaching power than ordinary people have had at almost any time, actually, I will say at than ordinary people have had simply at any time in human history. Um, and as they say, Spider-Man <laughs> and other places, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So I wanna convince you that we all have more responsibility than ordinary people at any time in human history have ever had. 
I started paying serious attention to climate change. I can't date it exactly, but sometime around when I came to Vassar, um, not because I came to Vassar, but around that time. Um, so that was around 2004. And my understanding of the problem uh, developed over the years as I learned more, but it really changed about three or four years ago. And it's changed, I think. This is part of what I want to convince you of, um, because I think the problem itself changed over just the last three or four years and changed in ways that I think a lot of people don't recognize yet. We're still catching up with it. Um, so to show you what I mean, I want to start by describing the problem as it was maybe a decade ago. This is actually probably still true five or six years ago, but I'm going to take a decade ago as my starting point. So this graph, um, uh, this is not from the IPCC reports, but it's based on them. Um, uh, for now, concentrate on the pink part of the graph. Um, it shows an emissions trajectory over the next century-ish um, uh, that uh, in recent IPCC reports was called RCP 8.5. I think it has a new name in the most recent report. Um, but in 2012, um, the time that we're taking as our base frame, this was referred to as the business as usual scenario. This was what would happen, the path that we were on, if we didn't make a radical course change, right? Um, and for good reason. So if you can see, I can't really point, but if you see the black line, which is historical emissions up to that point, you see it's sort of upticking there um, at the end. Oh, thank you, a little laser. I, no. did I do that? Oops. What did I do? Sorry. Oh, there, okay, I got it back. I'm not gonna mess with the laser. Um, it's, up, it's upticking there. And that's because, so you can think, here's what's going on in 2012. Is the US, 46% of our electric power was still from coal, right? And the developing world, right, in which people still, large numbers of people still did not have the access even to any form of electricity, right? They wanted to catch up reasonably, like very, very reasonably. So China at this time, was bringing one new coal-fired power plant online every three days. Other developing countries were not quite as rapid, but they were working on it, right? And with good reason, because their people like didn't have the most basic things. And so quite reasonably, um, they wanted to catch up with us. And uh, not with us, but they wanted like reasonable standards of living for their own citizens. Um, and renewable energy just wasn't an affordable option, especially in poorer countries at that time. So if you follow sort of, you know, the, the, so that RCP 8.5, that comes from just sort of like following that black line out in the way it's pointing and the way things were going then. And where it heads toward is by 2100, you have global annual emissions, which are three times what they were in 2012, right? You had a temperature rise of, four and a half degrees maybe by 2100. But the thing was, it wasn't stopping in 2100, right? That the, the temperature rise was still going up. And so four and a half degrees then, and then more, right? Um, and that's a scenario that many scientists looked at and said, this is an existential threat to humanity. This is a scenario in which we are possibly talking about human extinction, or at least human civilizational collapse. I'm going to come back to the lower parts of the chart in a minute. So the problem, here's the structure that the problem seemed to many observers to have at the time, a structure that's often called a tragedy of the commons, where we would all be better off if we could all agree together. We're going to make a sacrifice. We're going to cooperate. It's going to be economically costly to us. So it is a sacrifice but we're all gonna hold hands and do it together and cut back on our emissions and we'll all be better off. But the thing about a tragedy of the commons is for each individual party, so party could be nations or it could be subnational groups, I would be better off if everyone else did that and I got to keep on emitting, keep on doing what I'm doing, right? So it was a problem of trust and a problem of incentives. It was a wicked hard problem, right? And many people thought 
I think the only way we're possibly going to solve this and get ourselves off of that horrendous trajectory is if we have this binding international agreement and sort of top-down agreement and similar things at national levels. And that is our only chance. If we cannot do that, humanity looked doomed. Right? That, looked, that was a fair characterization, or at least heading into unknown and tremendously dangerous bad territory. Um, I want to try and convince everyone that the problem we face now is a very different shape, different structure from the problem we faced just a decade ago. And in ways that I think most people, or many people, don't yet recognize. So to see this, look at the graph again. And now look at the orange pathway, right? That is where the policies that governments around the world have adopted, that's the pathway that they point to, right? That's where right now with current policies, they seem to be headed. Um, two things to recognize, and the turquoise line is pledges and targets that countries have announced, but they haven't really written into policy or law. So two things to recognize about these, and these are like, these things seem to be in tension with each other, but you gotta keep both of them in mind, I think, right? The first thing is that these pathways, the orange and the turquoise ones, right? They are morally terrible pathways still. They are anything above one and a half degrees of warning. This is what the IPCC has been telling us for many years now, several years now, um, is a world with immense, unnecessary human suffering and displacement and death. A world with immense injustice because the people suffering first and worst are the very poorest and most vulnerable people who've done nothing, nothing to cause the problem, right? So it's a, terribly, it's a terrible moral world that we are pointed towards right now. That's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind though, is that it's very different from that pink world, right? It's not a world, most scientists think, in which we are headed towards human extinction. It's not a world in which we're headed towards civil, civilizational collapse. Probably, we hope, <laughs> right? Um, so what does that mean? What that means is that the question we face isn't the binary, is humanity doomed? Or can we stop climate change? That is just the wrong question, right? The right question is how good or bad a world we're going to allow, how much suffering, how much displacement and death we are going to allow, and how much we're going to prevent, right? Um, how much human flourishing there will be. And the practical version of that question, the challenge is how do we take that orange curve, which is where we're heading now, and bend it down further, right? So that there is less suffering, less injustice, less death. To answer that question, I think, you have to understand how in the world did we get here? Remember I said a decade ago, it looked like the only way that we were gonna get anywhere is because we had this tragedy of the commons type situation is if we could all reach these binding agreements. That didn't happen. Federal climate legislation in the US and in most other countries that was meaningful didn't happen. The Obama administration had to move through the EPA and even that got blocked through the courts. And yet here we are on this lower trajectory. So what happened? If we wanna understand how to move it lower, we have to understand how we got here. There's an answer. This is from the IPCC report that came out just this week. These are, the top ones are prices of renewable energies, solar power, wind power, power um, uh, lithium ion batteries, which are what power EVs. Um, uh, and what you see is they have fallen like a stone faster than anyone predicted. And corresponding to that, you see in the lower graphs, is that their deployment, their ad adaptation, is shooting up like a rocket, faster than anyone predicted. So if you look at the, uh, just as an example, the photovoltaic, $600 a megawatt hour in 2000, 350 in 2010, something around 50 
$5 a megawatt hour for today, right? And still heading down. So how did that happen, right? One way you might think that happened is there must have been some big technological breakthrough. You know, scientists in a lab did this great new discovery in physics, and that's what it didn't happen, right? A solar panel today is basically, it, there, there have been a million iterative small improvements, but it's the same basic technology as in 1976 when it cost $1,000 for a single watt of solar power. Same basic technology. What happened? was this amazing thing called a learning curve. And I don't have time to talk about it. I really wish I did because I like it. <laughs> it's very cool and I, I like to explain it. Um, but just to say just this much, some goods that we produce uh, experience learning goods and some do not, right? And there is a, a whole bunch of, a whole body of research as to like which ones and why. Um, but, but goods that, character, that are characterized by learning curves are goods that we get, as we make more of them, we get better at making them. We learn how to make them better. And this process repeats in a tight, iterative circle. So the more we make, the more we learn about how to make them, and the more we make, the cheaper they get. And the way it's expressed is with each doubling of production. So you see this is a log scale where each tick along the bottom is a doubling. In the case of solar PV, each doubling of production, doubling of the total quantity you produce, the, the price declines by about 30 to 40%. That's called a learning rate. The thing is, the things that are on learning curves, like all kinds, decades of industrial research, you know, the, the case par excellence is semiconductors, computer chips. They tend to stay on learning curves for decades and decades. And so what that means, this has really profound implications. It means that solar, wind, batteries, and you can also add to that list hydrogen electrolyzers, which allow you to use renewable energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And also maybe, maybe it looks like heat pumps. So like core technologies of the energy, tra the transition we need, they are already very cheap all of a sudden. That's what's changed. And they are getting cheaper rapidly, right? They are part, in this virtuous cycle where the cheaper they get, the more we deploy, and the more we deploy, the cheaper they get. And you can add to that cycle, the more we deploy, the more people who are like employed working in these industries, and the more businesses are making money in these industries. And that's a constituency that says, hey, politicians support these industries. And because it's cheaper, it's actually easier and easier to support these industries. It's not expensive, right? And the cycle continues. So this is the world we live in now. We live in a world where the core things we need for the energy transition don't require technological breakthrough. They just need to be like driven down those learning curves. And in that kind of world, there's a very simple roadmap for decarbonizing the world. It's not everything we need to do, this oversimplifying, but it is the biggest part of what we need to do. It's two steps, right? And not sequentially, do these at the same time. You want to is decarbonize the electric grid by deploying lots and lots and lots of renewables fast. And the second is take all those things that are your boiler or your furnace in your home, your automobile industry that directly burn fossil fuels and instead electrify them. Right, And for a lot of those applications, like in industry, 10 years ago, that would have looked just like crazily expensive. And now there are pathways for just about every process to do that and to do it affordably and ever more affordably as we drive down the cost curve, right? So again, this isn't everything we need to do to fight climate change, but it is the biggest part. So here's one takeaway so far, right? It's a pretty amazing one, I think and that couldn't have been be more different from how things looked in 2012. The world is going to decarbonize. That snowball, for a while, we were having to like push it up this hill with subsidies, et cetera. It's now going down the hill on its own. It is accelerating, right? The snowball is rolling on its own power and I don't think it can be stopped, right? But that's not a reason that's not like, okay, so we can sit back. Right? There are plenty of incumbent business interests and their political allies 
that might see where the snowball is going, but they still want to make money for the next couple of decades, for a couple more decades while they can, selling fossil fuels, for instance, right? And so they want to slow it down, right? It's called predatory delay. That's the name for it. And so the problem that we face in 2022 is entirely different from the one in 2012. It's how do we, one, remove the obstacles, and two, accelerate the snowball. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, it's going to get there. We're going to decarbonize. But in the meantime, we are pumping carbon into the atmosphere, warming the future every single day. And that is going to take a toll. That's going to be felt in people's lives, right? So, but there's one more great thing, which is with this picture, right? With this story of where we are, you don't need top-down agreement. A top-down agreement would still be great. Like if we had an international climate treaty, that would be a wonderful thing. I'd be, I'd be all for it. If we had federal climate action, like President Biden's Build Back Better Act, if some version of that got passed, that would be enormously helpful and enormously good and important. But even if those don't happen, there's a ton that can be done from the bottom up because the nature that the problem is now. The snowball, like every little push counts. Every little push helps to accelerate it. And that just counts for itself, right? If you buy, if you take your furnace and replace your gas boiler with uh, an electric heat pump, you're not just decarbonizing, you know, removing that many emissions that you would have committed. You're making the heat pump cheaper so that the next person who might be more price sensitive than you or might, will be faster to deploy the next heat pump and drive the price down still further and accelerate the snowball. So I don't think I have time to talk. To, I'm not gonna talk through all this because uh, I wanna, um, um, this, you, you can look at it. <laughs> um, but I'll say one thing. Um, so the great thing about working from the bottom up is individuals, as individuals, have a tremendous amount of leverage. So if you want to make federal climate policy, you know, you all know, like in Washington, D.C., around every single little congressperson, there is this huge swirl of money and lobby groups and uh, organization bringing to bear. So, you know, it's very hard for an individual or an activist to, to do anything. But by contrast, I'll tell you a story. I, in uh, 2019, I went with a group organized, it was a group called NY Renews, organized 50 of us maybe, 60 of us on a day, um, a few different times to, uh, to go to Albany to lobby state legislators to pass this act called the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Really powerful act. It mandates 100% renewable energy in New York by 2040, not renewable, 100% decarbonized energy, and economy-wide across every sector of the economy, including agriculture, net zero by 2050 in New York State. So really powerful, right? And you go to these state legislators' offices, and they have maybe one aide, maybe two aides working, and they have dozens or hundreds of bills coming across their desk. So they have no clue. Most of them do not know what is in the CLCPA, the bill we're lobbying for, and they are really happy. No one visits them. They are really happy when you go lobby, talk to them and lobby and tell them what's in. And so 50 or 60 people wandering around the Capitol can actually move the needle and the bill passes, you know, not like in Washington, D.C., but that bill then is A, having an impact on the ground in New York State, but B, then Washington State and Colorado and other states take that bill as a model and pass even more ambitious climate legislation. Even cities, Ithaca, New York, has just said, we're gonna work with this company called Block Power and we're gonna bring in finance from outside and we are going to electrify every single building in the whole city of Ithaca over the next few years. And when they do that, right, that makes it easier for the next city. And then eventually for that to become a state policy somewhere and then the next state, tremendous leverage from the bottom up. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this because I don't wanna, I don't wanna leave time for other things. Um, Okay. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, it's going wrong direction. Oh my God, here we go. There's where I want it to be. Um, so here's my takeaway for you. We really do live at an amazing time in human history. Like, as far as I can understand, a unique time in the whole history of humanity until now, where 
our actions as individuals have incredible, unprecedented leverage. Two kinds of leverage, right? One is what I was talking about is like you accelerate the snowball and that makes it go faster so that it's like easier for the next person, right? But the other kind of leverage is every bit of carbon dioxide that we put into the air now is gonna stay there for a thousand years or more, right? Or not every bit, but large bits. <laughs> um, and so the actions that we take now are going to be ramifying through the climate system, affecting human beings for not just decades, but centuries and maybe more than that, maybe a thousand years, maybe more. And so this is what ordinary people now, this not just now, but a hundred years from now and 300 years from now, this is what we have the power to affect with our little actions. Every ton, additional ton of carbon we emit means more of this. But the flip side is every ton of carbon that we are able to stop with every little push on that snowball, every fraction of a degree of warming that we're able to prevent means less of this, right? It's an awesome amount of power to have. And I can't think of any historical parallel right? Being alive right now is an awesome responsibility. If you look at it the right way, I think it's also an awesome privilege, right? To have that kind of power for good. Uh, if I could draw, which I could not, my image would be that orange curve with all of us like hanging off the back <laughs> bottom of it, like bending it down with all our might, right? Like collectively where each little person adds leverage and bends that down. Uh, I can't draw, uh, so instead I'll give you this image as a final image for, uh, for where I think we are right now. This is what the problem looks like and what we have to do right now. Right. So my talk is going to have precisely the same takeaway as Jeff's, that we are living in an incredible time in human history, but I'm going to argue that we are living at an incredible time in the history of our entire planet for solving the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in. So um, I'm an assistant professor in earth science and geography, and what I'm going to talk about today is a result of or, um, reflections on a couple years of teaching climate science at Vassar. Um, I teach classes on climate and ocean change, as well as a course on mass extinctions, which as, can you, as you can imagine are some very heavy topics. And when I survey students at the beginning of the semester, I ask them, is there anything that you're worried about for this class? And a lot of people will say, I'm really worried about learning about climate and ocean science because it can be really demoralizing, it can be really depressing. And so we know Jeff just told us that every single degree, fraction of a degree matters, right? And we can't afford to have this you know, feeling of demoralization and apathy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about two ways from the climate science angle that I think we can help to address those um, really difficult emotions we feel around learning about climate change and think about some ways forward. Um, so it's gonna have two parts. I'm gonna talk about what Jeff just talked about a little bit from a different angle, climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. And I already feel better hearing about the future, right? In 2022 compared to 2012. And then I'll talk a little bit about something completely different, which is thinking about how the geologic record and deep time, thinking about the deep time perspective, helps us to think about the future in a different way. Okay, so the first thing, I wanna put up some of these headlines. This is from 2019 from a climate change report, or sorry, from an IPCC report on the oceans. And I would say, actually, I think these headlines are kind of stuck in that 2012 vision of what is happening on our planet. So for example, we get this sense of we're really driving off a cliff here. So we're all in big trouble. Climate panel sees a dire future. The oceans we know won't survive climate change. And the last one, which kind of sounds sort of like a Buzzfeed list, like nine ways that the Arctic and oceans are in unprecedented trouble, which is a little weird. Um, so nowhere in these headlines were the content from this IPCC report that talked about the mitigation and adaptation strategies that were discussed in great detail 
um, that we have at our disposal and should be dis discussing as a society. So for example, this is the um, report on changing ocean marine ecosystems and dependent communities. So in addition to talking about how climate is changing and it's impacting the ocean and how it's impacting the most vulnerable communities that are living in ocean ecosystems, they also had a big section about risk reduction responses and their governance. So really digging into these difficult questions of how do we think about mitigation and adaptation strategies, which are necessary, and how do we do this with justice and equity at the forefront? So um, for example, I'm gonna show this figure, which is, um, there's a lot happening, is this a little pointer? Yeah, there's a lot happening on this figure, so I'll, I'll break it down in a couple minutes, but the main point is just to say, we are at the point where mitigation and adaptation are necessary. We know that. We know that we've locked in a certain amount of warming and sea level rise. And we need to be discussing as a society how we can do this ethically, equitably, and justice at the forefront. So this, this figure, just to um, tell you kind of how it works, all over here, these are different marine-based solutions or mitigation or adaptation strategies for climate change. So I'll zoom in on a couple of them. And over here, these are the benefits. And if the dark blue circle, if it's really dark, that means it's a really big benefit. And if it's really dark red, that means it's a really big constraint. So a really big negative. Okay, so you can see how they've ranked and discussed all of these different ideas for how we can start to mitigate and adapt to climate change, but none of those things are really included in these major headlines, right? So if we zoom in on this figure, okay, this is the first two. So we talked about marine renewable energy. This would be like tidal energy, that figure that Jeff showed about the cost of tidal energy. We know that it has huge impacts in reducing warming and the other co-benefits are pretty strong. We have some trade-offs, but they're not as great as, for example, ocean fertilization, which is a very controversial kind of geoengineering technique where you basically fertilize the oceans to make plankton grow and they soak up carbon. And we really have no idea how that would play out in the actual ocean, it's very risky. So there are very few benefits and there's a lot of really strong trade-offs and governability challenges. So there's so much interesting and exciting stuff that we can dig into here that I think really helps when thinking about how do we start to envision the future? What are the steps we can take um, to help mitigate and adapt to climate change? This is another figure from the report that I really like, and it also addresses this in a different way. So this is looking at reef communities over time. So thinking about the, um, the journey of a degraded reef to a pristine reef, and this has high ecological complexity and also has high reef services. So this is basically saying a very happy and ecologically diverse reef. So over time, what we can think about now is how can we restore a degraded reef so that it's restored under climate change. It's not a perfect pristine reef that we're aiming towards, right? We have to accept some of that loss that's already occurred, but it gives us a vision of what we can work for towards that reef of tomorrow, right? So we can have these restoration scenarios and think about how to best do this in a ecologically sound way in order to think about that long-term future um, that, we, that we should start thinking about. Um, I also wanna highlight um, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson's work on this and Jeff has her book right over there called All We Can Save. She is a huge proponent of this idea, there we go, perfect, of climate solutions and especially the ocean being a reservoir of climate solutions. And I love when she, when people ask her, you know, like, what can I do as an individual? She'll say, well, what are you good at, right? And it really, tells you that there's a role for everyone to play in thinking about these climate solutions and in, in driving them forward. Um, so that's the end of my part one, where we're thinking about modern climate change and kind of the media narrative around these reports and how we, um, in, how we kind of digest those narratives and bring them forward. Now I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different. And I think that the geologic past, while maybe seems esoteric, can help us a lot to understand and think about modern climate change. So um, the motivation for this is when I survey students when they come out of a class um, that I call, uh, that's called mass extinctions, oftentimes they talk about how they don't quite know why, but for some reason they feel a lot more comfort and hope for the future. That it's hard to articulate, but there a lot of them are feeling that. And so I've been trying to figure out why is that the case? What is it about the geologic past that helps us to feel this sense of comfort and hope for the future, or at least resolve for the future. So I will talk a little bit about how context from the past can help us with these collective efforts. And this is a plot over here that shows us biodiversity over time. 
And so high diet biodiversity is like a very healthy, right, ecosystem. And over geologic time, this is 600 million years. This is an extremely long time. We've had five big dips. You can see here, these are all the mass extinctions. So these are massive events in Earth's history that completely changed the scale of our ecosystems, the makeup of them, which species were even around. And after them, we had this recovery period. We had this time of establishment of new ecosystems. We had really interesting ecological interactions that are setting up the new world that's coming out of this catastrophe. And so sort of spoiler alert, I think talking about that recovery and imagining that recovery gives us a vision for the future and how that future is actually going to exist. Um, so let me give you a couple more examples of that. So one thing that I think is very important is this um, paper that came out in 2020 that really shifted my views on what even is nature, right? What is the natural world? And this paper showed, what this is showing is the percent of the land area on our planet compared to years, and this goes back to 8,000 BC. And what they're showing is that only 20% of our land surface has been really untouched by human activity for 10,000 years, right? So before this time, before we think of human impact on the environment as happening in the modern day, right? The um, shaping of these natural, quote unquote, natural landscapes was a, a product of human activity, right? So we know that human beings have created the natural world we know today, and that really benefits from having that deep time perspective. This deep time is pretty recent in geologic time, but this also points to the fact that indu indigenous stewardship practices and sovereignty are critical towards thinking about these long practices of land stewardship that have existed for thousands of years that have created the natural world that we know today. Okay, and then if we go back a little bit further in time, so this was only, 8,000 years. And if we go about a little, a little bit further, I'm gonna take you all the way back to 65 million years ago, which is this 8,000 years is this tiny blip on this graph here. Now we're going back all the way to 65 million years ago. And you can see that this is the temperature of the planet and how it's changed over time. So we've had all these interesting, you know, bumps and steps in the temperature change of the atmosphere. And we know that around 55 million years ago, we were in a hot house. This is called the Eocene. We had a planet where crocodiles were swimming at the poles and we had um, atmospheric CO2 that was really high. And we've slowly descended into this cool house and this ice house state, which we find ourselves in now where we have glacial ice caps, et cetera. So this geologic record gives us context for what we are doing today, right? We can see these different RCPs over here in comparison to the geologic past. So luckily, yes, we are not going on this RCP 8.5 path, which would bring us back to temperatures seen in the Eocene, right? But we're maybe somewhere more along these trajectories. And we can think about what does our past world look like that experienced those temperatures? So this is just one way to say this is a really important um, context that the geologic past gives us about modern climate change. And I'm gonna just zoom in for a few minutes on the um, end Cretaceous, this mass extinction that killed the dinosaurs and thinking about the recovery from that and how that might help students think about the future recovery of, of our um, planet in the face of human-derived climate change. So if we zoom in on this, this big event, this is a little animation that shows probably the worst day on planet Earth, right? We had the worst that can happen, a giant asteroid hitting the surface of the planet, causing this so-called apocalypse, right? And we had the ejecta that was spread out over the entirety of the, the South southern central United States. And so as geologists, we might wanna know what happened, but for the modern climate, we might wanna know, right, how did life respond and how long did it take to recover? And so in imagining that recovery, I think we can really start to imagine our own recovery, right? And the things we can do to step towards that direction. So in 2016, this is a really, um, I'm just gonna move my little face for a second if I can. Can you move my face? Oh no, it's all right. So. In 2016, people went out and they drilled into the crater where the dinosaurs, right, the asteroid hit that killed the dinosaurs. So this is on the coast of Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. And they went in and recovered the rocks and the sediments that record this massive event. So it records the actual impact itself. It records then the reestablishment of ecosystems and the recovery of life. So you can't really see it here, but this is just basically white stuff, which is like a happy, living ecosystem recovering after 
this massive event, these impact rocks, which totally jumbled everything up on the seafloor and caused these big units to be deposited. And so from this end Cretaceous mass extinction, what we've learned is that the loss of dinosaurs, yes, was um, tragic, but it opened the space for mammals and life responded pretty fast, geologically speaking, after a truly cataclysmic event. And so I think thinking about this scale of recovery allows us to envision, even if not totally on the same time scale, envision the future of planet Earth. So here's some of my takeaways from the geologic record that I think are, are helping. We know that life itself is incredibly resilient. We know that new species evolve to fill gaps of others who go extinct. And past extinction events have really set up the modern world that we know today. And so I don't think that this, by putting us in this scale of geologic time, it necessarily makes people feel better because it makes you feel small or like insignificant or like nothing matters. I think it allows you to think big about the recovery of ecosystems on our planet Earth. And the thing that's different now, right, is that we are here to shape this future. So we know there will be a future on planet Earth, right? We're not driving simply off a cliff. We're here to shape it. And especially in terms of modern climate science, how we tell those stories in the media and climate science communication really matters, right? Those messages really matter. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. It's up to you. Okay, um, they're good, good, oh, is it, oh, it, sorry, it's right, <laughs> right, okay, um, I will uh, actually, I will take this opportunity because uh, my exhibition is down there and I don't know if you all saw it, and I will take this opportunity to thank the people who have done this for me which is Ron, thank you so much, Ron. I don't know if Angelina is here, but she also helped tremendously mm -hmm. and the director of the library to have me here and all those hands who made this beautiful exhibition with the catalogs possible. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, regarding talking about my response to climate, I said, I will take you a little bit because I will talk mainly in relation to my work but I will take you a little bit through the, my history, how I got to do these books, because I not always did that and how my interest in nature developed. Um, I'm, I'm really so glad to be here in person today, which would almost be totally unthinkable just a, couple, a little while ago. So I do hope that from now on we're moving into a more mask-free world, which would be nice, right? Um, so I like to talk um, about the impact or the response, which you can see in my work, to what's happening in the world today, like the changing of the climate. Climate change, uh, climate change seems still to be a total not real thing for many people nowadays. And if you think about it, uh, is, if you think about what's happening in Ukraine, and which is creating a totally global crisis and millions of people are added to the millions of refugees from around the world that are in search for a new home, for food, for a new life. One starts wondering who cares about climate change. Yes, a lot of people cannot care because they don't have the luxury of doing this. They're just living on the minimum on a daily basis and um, they're hoping to to find a home, they're hoping to get food on the table just for the next day. These people cannot care because they have too many other things of the daily life struggle to deal with. But we who are here in safety and life is comfortable should care and raise awareness since in the long run we can help those who cannot participate. And that is why I'm here today to speak to you all who have the possibility to listen either here in this room or on Zoom in the safety of their homes. 
I'm also here to speak to all of you young students, since you are the eyes and the minds of the future. I would like to encourage you to, to participate in making this world a better one by sharing my, sharing my thoughts with me uh, in my words and through my art. A little bit about myself, which you mostly, you probably know most of it because it's in the catalog. Uh, I came from Germany to this country and studied at Sony Purchase where I did my master's in foreign arts. I studied with the uh, Uruguayan American artist Antonio Frasconi who was best known for his political charge, dynamic woodcuts, a woodcut prints. His work became a tremendous influence upon mine, together with the works of German writers and artists such as Amsel Kiefer, Bertolt Brecht, and Rainer Maria Rilke. So Rilke and Brecht are very opposite from each other, but I needed both. I needed Brecht's voice of reason and Rilke's voice of emotions. My very first books were just mainly limited edition books. They had nothing to do with environment uh, or stuff. So they were uh, mainly uh, in collaborations with contemporary poets at this time. Some of them are not alive anymore. And then I also did a tremendous amount of graphic work for the theaters in New York City in collaboration with playwright, translator, and critic Eric Bentley. And he, Eric and I also produced a privately very small uh, 10 small limited edition books with his translations uh, on German writers, Hugo Wolf, Bertha Brecht, etc. At some point, printmaking alone did not satisfy me. That is when I started to make more and more painted books and paintings again. Up to then, my work was very concentrated on the tragedy of war. Since war doesn't only impact uh, innocent people and in the present, but it also, also the consequences of wars are felt for generations to come. Wars strongly affect on the environment by causing air, affects the environment by causing air, ground, and water pollution that will be long lasting. And if, if nuclear sites are disturbed, contamination and health problems occur in addition. In 2012, I was uh, in. I was participating in an exhibition at the Sermolodowski Museum, which was entitled uh, Nature, no, it was entitled Dear Mother Nature. This is when I really started to focus more and more on nature, and I became an advocate for its protection and to save its beauty. The pandemic has changed all of us, but despite all the great losses we experienced in the last two years, we also have developed and shown great strengths, devotion, and love for each other. We were able, in the times of isolation, to focus on different things, and one of them was nature for many people. City, people, from the, people from the city moved to the country, closer to nature, in lesser populated areas, and by doing so, became, uh, came to appreciate nature more and started to pay more attention to the dark cloud of climate change, that is hanging over us. I grew up in a very small town in Germany, in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. Talking to trees, there was almost the only exciting thing. I, of course, I'm exaggerating now, but it seems to me when I was young like that. <laughs> so today I know um, that growing up so close to nature in the little villages and forests and everything, has developed my deep love for nature. And watching it become destroyed by us has led to my wish to manifest my thoughts about this in my work. The works shown in this exhibition celebrate the beauty of nature and at the same time mourn its destruction. The heavy encrusted surface of my paintings and books include plants, sand, and found objects in order for me, I want to give a more strong sense of physical presence. I used to show this book uh, if I had exhibition with paintings together in galleries, and usually I wanted them to be totally open because I wanted people to turn the pages and, and feel also the texture of the page, place, uh, page. But that's not always possible because they get also probably used up a little bit. Um, 
My books speak of the importance of trees for, for men's soul and for our ecosystem, of the importance of the soil, our, our life-giving source, of our waters such as rivers and the ocean that slowly getting more and more polluted, of the impact that oil spills have on ocean life and the marshlands. And here we are, oops, something happened here. Uh, okay. Uh, this is oil, I want to point out oil, oil spill book three. I did three books. One was I did uh, on the, when the big oil spill was in uh, the Gulf of New Mexico. I think that was 2010, if I'm not mistaken. And then I did a second book on oil spill, which was um, on the marshlands. Uh, how it affected the marshlands. And then this third book, um, which you see here a couple of pages of, which I'm going to show you. Um, the, yeah, this is a painting. This, it was a series of paint, it's a series of paintings and books. This third book is about, uh, dedicated to Nigeria, the largest oil producer of Africa. Oil has become the curse of this nation and led to poverty and corruption since excessive oil produ production polluted the rivers and with this took away the livelihood of the local fishermen. In this book, this is a painting which, there is also a page in the book which you can't, no, which is open, it's in the, it's, where is that? It's, it's right where the archives are, right? It's an open page. I also, this is a painting and you see those little bones, uh, these are really little fish bones which I thought was interesting. <laughs> I took them after we had, I bought the fish and then I put them in the soil and let them stay there for a long period of time. And when I put them out, all I had the bones, the little microbes and whatever, ate totally down. I cooked them afterwards after all, and then I put them in my painting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so next to these dark facts, I did not want to neglect the beauty of nature and we have therefore in this exhibition juxtaposed books that show nature's beauty to the ones just mentioned. The juxtaposition makes us clearly see what we are losing if we continue with this neglect. And we hopefully will reevaluate and try to stop what is harming nature and destroys its beauty. I like to briefly talk about two series of my books which are very dear to me and I did a lot of work and one is a series about trees and one and the importance of trees and one is about the uh, salinization of the soil. Um, the series is called Trees are Sanctuaries. This is, book is down there in the library and this page I think is the one which is open. That is a new book and it's num book number two on Trees are Sanctuaries and um, the title for this is taken from Hermann Hesse, who wrote beautiful, beautiful about trees, very beautiful. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so this is, um, and always with these books, I have done also a large series of paintings. And I want to show you, this is the book downstairs. And this is an installation, um, actually in the Coton Library, where Mary is here, she's a curator. <laughs> and, these are all paintings of trees, and there are two, pa two paintings in it where I used, um, no wait, this way. Oh yeah, these paintings have an overlay with, t with excerpts from um, Langston Hughes', huge poem, Let America Be America Again, Let It Be The Dream. It, uh, the Dream, it, what was that? The, uh, wait a minute, I forgot. Let it be the dream it used to be. It is a dream of equality, free speech, peace, justice, and freedom. I so trees, so often my trees and paintings and books are dark and sharp fra fragments um, of nature. Uh, and <clears throat> nature and express the loss we will experience if we do not protect our forests. They are also standing strong and untouchable and become symbols of hope, new beginnings and regeneration. Um, there is an in installation with trees, I think I'll show that later because I didn't put it here. Okay. The other series I did a lot of work on is on the erosion of the soil. And 
these are the paintings you see downstairs on the right on the right side. That's what's hanging down there. And this are uh, there in my studio when I was working on it. And the one on the right you see there is one on the left with the sun that shows our nature beautiful when everything seems to be perfect to me at least. And the right one, it, it already shows what is happening if it, it, it's called arid land. The land gets drier and drier and drier. And there are two books in the show. This is called Salty Soil. And these books speak of the soil, the living cover of, our, of the earth, one of our greatest resources in the habitat of countless species. And this, the soil must be kept healthy for us to stay alive. Soil salinization has become a serious concern caused by natural occurrences, but more often by irrigation, deforestation, overgrazing, and the use of chemicals and pesticides. Is that correct, Laura? <laughs> because you're the expert. Um, all this increases the natural salt content of the soil and leads to serious erosion that will turn our farmlands and meadows into wastelands or better said deserts over time. So all these books want to express that. And I use a lot of scent. These are paintings that belong also to the series. And there's another book which is in the show which is called The Erosion of Villages and Fields. And you can see here, I'm, I'm letting the scent grow over, these are photographs. Actually, I took them in Germany. And and the, the scent for me is a symbol of the passing of time. It, it slowly moves into over everything. And at the end, everything is covered. It's desert. It's covered with scent, scent if we are continue like this. And there's another picture of that. That's one page. You can see it even more clearly how everything gets slowly disintegrates. I wanted to show this, which is, uh, this is an installation I did. It's called Trees, Our Silent Companions. And this was very interesting. It, it shows this time the natural occurrences, what, how things disintegrate in the natural world normally without us necessarily um, messing it up. I had those tree trunks. Uh, and I carved into, in, you can see on the side, I carved the text in there from different poets, like there was Wittmann and Storo and a couple of other poets. I carved excerpts of nature poems in there. I got a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome afterwards, but that's okay. That's besides the point. <laughs> and so, and then I did an installation at the Unison Art Center. Um, and and arranged all of them in a circle in the middle is sand, and then a little tree, which is tree of life, because all the trunks also wanted to say how, how much we cut, what, how cutting down of trees is harmful for us. And um, this installation was, there, installation was there for two years. The second year is see what happens. The trunks became totally almost black and Laura told me they're also very tiny, uh, what are they called, little microbes, microbes, which are black, right, black microbes, which, which are natural occurrences, and they ate it down. It was even almost, the trunk looked even blacker, but I just took the point, and the, 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 the text was totally, totally fading away more and more. So this was just an exhibition, and it was interesting to watch, um, watch it erode naturally. And right now, this is my last picture. Uh, this is, is also the same principle. I have taken three paintings just to watch the natural, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the effects of the elements on things, like in this case, paintings. I wanted to see what the elements of nature will do to it. And this would be natural occurrence, nothing men, may, men, men done, so to speak. And so I put these paintings out um, about in the winter and the snow. And now I took them out and then they will go down into an exhibition into Long Beach Island uh, Arts. Now what is it called? Long Beach Island Arts and Science Foundation 
the, uh, in an exhibition, but it will be also out, out in, in New Jersey, and it will be also outdoors and further disintegrate. So we see what happened to that one. Anyway, I like to close um, by saying it is really my dream that my work will speak to many people and that together we will look for solutions and get actively involved to find ways to contribute to the protection of the environment. Even if my work speaks only to a few or only to one person, I will be totally overjoyed since I believe in the quote by Yoko Ono. She says, a dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. Thank you. And one more advice, plant, go home and plant a tree because one tree in its lifetime absorbs one tons of carbon dioxide over its lifetime. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, panel, Jeff, Laura, and Elsa. One thing we were trying to achieve with this uh, gathering, of course, is that we would have people from different perspectives and different from different academic disciplines even. And uh, I think we definitely achieved that. And I, I know I learned a lot in so many ways. Um, so we have a little time for questions. And um, what I think we'll do because we're on the Zoom is if you have a question, um, you can ask it and then I'll repeat it so it, it can be heard over the, the webinar. And then uh, if it's addressed to someone, they'll be able to respond. Did you have a question? Oh, oh okay, in the back. So um, I was just wondering if the panelists could be the uh, Oh. Thank you. Okay, so our first question was uh, asking if the panelists could perhaps respond one to another uh, what they thought of the different presentations. Um, I really uh, resonated with um, Jeff's presentation talking about the evolution of how people have been thinking about climate change and the nature of the problem. And I think it really helped to explain to me why the news headlines are still so um, like deeply despairing because I think there's a real history of that, you know, and so that that really helped me and that was really interesting. And then I think the role of of art and including everyone and being part of the solution is a really fundamental message to send out that everyone has a role to play in the in the climate climate crisis and finding solutions. I'll add. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I like both of these talks of the art very, very much. Um, so I mean, the, the perspective of ge geological time is, uh, you're right, it's comforting. <laughs> you know, but it, uh, it, it, it does help. Um, and I think art, I mean, I, I, the specific art, right, for this stuff is, is, is powerful. Um, but, but I also think, I mean, it's really important that like, when people think like, I want to help combat climate change. What can I do? Right? It's not just uh, you know, oh, I have to go be an engineer and like build solar panels or something. I think like artists communicating, you know, sort of powerfully, like you know, here's what's beautiful in the world, and here's loss of beauty in the world, and uh, you know, and here's a tree. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, I, I think that's like that's a powerful thing because you know we need to like move everybody and so people who are communicators and artists are a kind of communicators you know that's a crucial role to play that's a way of like fighting the fight i think and so i i both appreciate the art in itself but i'm also sort of grateful for that that's nice thank you uh, yeah i for, for, i was extremely impressed with both of your presentations and i loved a lot um i have to admit some of the things you said was for, I'm, I'm not as sophisticated with all these things as I probably should be. I'm just on a more simple level. So it was for me a little hard to get into, 
But then I got a lot, I liked the factual aspect of it because a lot of things I have didn't know. And I loved also the idea of comparing this to history because that's a great mm -hmm. teacher, history is a great teacher in a lot of, in a lot of things, you know. So I think that was for me an incredible learning experience to listen to both of you because there are things I didn't really know. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. Oh, oh, well, this is good, well, yeah, well. If, if I could just repeat the question first, yeah. for, uh, for the people yeah. on Zoom. Um, Zilka was, and our second question was very happy to hear all the presentations and especially uh, pushing us toward this idea of hope, which was radical for me, by the way. Um, and she also wanted to hear, especially from um, Ilsa about, uh, her ideas about the emotions behind this, and uh, especially as it connects with literature. Is that a good? Do you guys mind if I take this off just for a minute? Oh, it's just, um, well, yeah, literature has played a big role in all my work, most of it even in the three books, because I. Be, I really got from Hermann Hesse because he wrote his beautiful books about trees. He has his thoughts about it. And so I used some of his text excerpts in some of the books. But when you come back to, to um, Brecht and Rilke, well, Brecht, at least he tried to be extremely removed from, uh, from what he was writing because he didn't want people to have emotions because he believed they can't be rational anymore. If, if they have too much emotions about something they see, they don't get the message because they get all mushy, you know, so to speak in a primitive sense of words. While Rilke was emotional. Everything he wrote was emotional. It was like about his heart, or, well, to even Brecht too. Brecht had, has written some incredible, wonderful poetry, which is extremely, sensitive and emotional, even so he doesn't, wouldn't admit that, but, but I didn't know him, but I don't think he would admit that. But uh, yeah, so my early work was even, was more influenced from poetry, but for some reason it creeps into my later work too, and I don't know what else to tell you, <laughs> or I don't know if that satisfies you, Liz Armstrong, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it, it just goes in there, you know, yeah. Oh yeah, I think it's, it's yeah. Answer. yeah. I so I I'm not sure if I heard the first part fully, but I heard you mention uh, Ukraine, 
and maybe how that's affecting all of this. Okay. And then uh, secondly, um, asking about the moral aspect of our, how we respond to climate change, especially vis-a-vis -vis fossil fuels. Yeah, I think uh, it's very much a moral issue. I mean, and I think it was a moral issue long before Ukraine, uh, but one more dimension to it now. But I think even apart from climate change, uh, I think it's quite a huge moral issue, but extracting, transporting, refining fossil fuels, it's a tremendously dirty business. And people who live where that happens in so-called sacrifice zone, Right, it, it is a tremendously powerful issue of justice. Right, I mean, it's on that earlier to say there is, you know, so that people can, so that we can live our fossil fuel economy powered economy, um, that people who live near oil refineries breathe terrible air, and people who live where fossil fuel is extracted have polluted water. Um, and so, you know, there are harms that are tremendously inequitable from it. Um, that's before you think about like what we're doing to people right now, but much more so, you know, going forward to the most vulnerable. And yeah, Ukraine is just another dimension. And I certainly hope, I mean, looks on the same, I mean, it's, it's a horror, right? But that Europe is responding, you know, in the short term, they'll need to import some more natural gas, et cetera, but that they are, that it is, they are responding by accelerating the transition away from fossil fuels in general. And uh, I hope, and this is the snowball theory, right? That like Europe doing that, even if like the US responds in the exact opposite direction, as like some politicians here want us to do, that just even Europe doing it, just like Europe, you know, a decade and a half ago, Germany putting in tons of solar panels, and subsidizing them, drove down the cost of solar panels so that other parts of the world could start doing it, uh, but you know we might have a version of that again. Where um, by you know, any place that reduces fossil fuel use makes it easier for every place else to do so. So yeah, um, I, I don't want to put like good things coming from moral horror, but maybe. So, yeah. I was just thinking about um, how the role of scientists is changing. I think in this moral responsibility, and I think. For a long time, people and scientists felt like they were needed to be apolitical, needed to stay above the fray, right, and not engage in that way. And I think in the last, you know, decade, probably, I don't know, people have started to recognize more that science does not exist in a vacuum and scientists have a role to play, right, in addressing these injustices and communicating about climate change in a personal way that's emotional, right, that's not sterile in a way that's um, really speaks to people. So I think that's also a, a sort of moral shift that's happening as well. Thank you all. I think we're past 630. So maybe we'll take one more question. Okay, so I think our last question was basically asking about the role of corporations and how much we could really fight against maybe competing interests that they might have. So I think it's absolutely true that there are corporations that stand to lose a lot of money from the transition away from fossil fuels and they are fighting it tooth and nail and they have a lot of power. 
right? And so I'm gonna give you an example, which is I think just so revealing and so outrageous, right? So lots of municipalities just in the last couple of years around the country have passed laws that say, okay, if you're building a new house, right? You can't connect natural, natural gas or fossil gas. You should just build it electric from the start, right? It's cheaper, it's cleaner air, and there's a climate reason. And 20 states, very much under pressure from fossil fuel country, companies, have state legislatures have passed preemption bills, they're called, that say a municipality cannot ban gas when it comes to houses. Um, so, I mean, that's just like, you know, these are states that frankly claim to favor like local control. And that's what we're all about. Um, and yet they, um, so yeah, absolutely. There's like corporate power that is an obstacle. But and this is what I think has changed since 2012 or change, you know, it's accelerated since 12. There are more and more businesses that stand to make money from this energy, this energy transition is a literally, literally the figure is in the trillions of dollars of change, right? Not, not billions, but trillions. And so whenever you have an incumbent industry that already exists and you have a new industry that doesn't fully yet exist, there's an asymmetry in sort of power, right? The incumbent industry, they've got, they're there, they have money, they have workers who they can organize and say, you know, your job is on the line, et cetera. But this, Snowball path, that, that's changing. And there are industries, corporations on the other side now, and they are organizing. And there are workers who are, you know, there, there are more workers installing solar panels than there are coal miners, like a lot more um, in this country. And it's growing every year. Um, so I share with you the pessimism about like the role of corporations in American politics and around the world. Um, but in this case, I think we're getting to a point where that can work in favor of good things, as opposed to against this, you know, forces on both sides. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Bob, for organizing.